Um, so thanks again, everyone, for being here. Uh, again, my name is Hannah Baranis, and we're going to be talking about flood hazard in the Gulf of Maine. Um, so the Gulf of Maine is a section of the northwestern Atlantic that extends, oh, actually, let me pull up my laser pointer here, too. That will probably be useful. Um, that extends from the northern shore of Cape Cod up into the Bay of Fundy, and it's bounded on the east by Nova Scotia um, and George's Bank. And so sort of looking at the subtitle of this talk from theoretical to community collaborative research, the, the theoretical piece um, will really be um, kind of centered around some work I did developing um, the theory behind calculating flood hazard statistics while I was in grad school at UMass. Then over my, I guess, relatively short career so far, I've been kind of inching from theoretical research towards community collaborative research. And um, I'm excited to be talking about this with you all um, here because I think that a lot of that journey really began during my time as a NECASC fellow when I was introduced to strategies for stakeholder driven research and the idea of co-developed research. So more specifically, um, I'll talk first about this work I did during my PhD, integrating tidal non-stationarity into flood hazard estimates. And what that means is essentially accounting for the fact that the height of high tide varies naturally from year to year in a predictable way. So when estimating flood hazard, so how likely we are to see certain types of coastal flooding, um, I worked on methods for kind of integrating that predictable and impactful information around tide height. Um, and eventually ended up working with um, John Woodruff and Rob DeCanto, who are faculty at UMass and Ruthie Halberstadt, grad student at UMass on incorporating, combining those um, that method with sea level rise projections to produce um, flooding projections for the city of Boston as a part of the Greater Boston Research Advisory Group. So I'll, I'll touch on that. Um, and then when I started my postdoc at Gulf of Maine Research Institute, which I might refer to as GMRI during the talk, um, I guess it's sort of been a non-traditional postdoc in that I got to spend the first six months really just talking to people and learning about what communities along Maine's 5,000 miles of tidally influenced coastline need. And so just in about the past half year, I've been writing proposals and kind of honed in on three projects that I'll I'm just spinning up that I'll touch on at the end of the talk. So one is um, developing flood risk assessments for specifically for working waterfront. Uh, second is developing a statewide coastal flood hazard model for Maine. It's something that's already been done in Massachusetts and is being developed in New Hampshire, so you all might be familiar with. Um, and the third is a project installing tide gauges and developing community science programs to both develop some localized flood hazard information and um, uh, flood impact information. So developing flood thresholds for specific communities. Okay, with that, let's um, let's dive in. And perhaps it's not advisable to start a talk with definitions, but I think it'll be worthwhile uh, for us to all get on the same page. So um, when we experience an extreme coastal sea level or a coastal flood, it's actually that total water level we observe is the sum of a bunch of different components that each have different, has different physical drivers behind it. So in this sort of, I'm gonna show a bit of a cartoon at the top and think of it as just an XY graph with water level on the Y axis and time on the X axis. So first, um, one thing that contributes to how bad flooding is, is how high sea level is. And we can measure mean sea level over different periods of time, depending on the period of time we measure it over. Um, it includes different physical forcings. Um, and then we have variability around mean sea level from tides. So those are forces among the Earth, Sun, and the Moon that predictably cause water level to go in the Gulf of Maine up and down twice per day. We call it predicted water level like you might guess, because we can predict tides. Um, and then the actual water level we measure, which is shown in the blue line, deviates from the predicted water level. Um, and that deviation is called the non-tidal residual. And in this cartoon, I've showed a tide cycle where the deviation is positive, so measured is higher than predicted. And that's often an indication that we're experiencing some sort of a storm event. And that rise in water level just from a storm event is what we call storm surge. Uh, in reality, in a lot of places along the coast, 
if it's an open exposed coastline, we're also that extre an extreme sea level will also include the influence of waves. And then if we're um, up in an estuary near a river, um, river discharge will also influence water level. Um, a term I'm going to be using is storm tide, and that is the rise in water level above mean sea level from the predicted tide or the predicted water level plus storm surge. Um, and the reason so one way to think of storm tide is if we were to look at a hundred year long record of water level of storm tides, we would not see a positive trend in storm tides because uh, the mean sea level is subtracted out. Okay, so why did John, I guess John and I get interested in this in the first place. So when I was a grad student at UMass in 2018, um, the Northeast Coast was hit by two record-breaking flooding events um, in January and March. And um, if you look at the Boston tide gauge record, um, a tide gauge is just an instrument that measures water level at the coast. It's about 100 years long. And you take the total water level measured in January 2018 during the flooding event and in March. In 100 years, those are the first and third highest water levels ever recorded at the gauge. And you might think, okay, I mean, th that makes sense. At the time in 2018, sea level was probably roughly higher than it's ever been. So maybe it makes sense. We've experienced the two highest water levels or the first and third highest water level in a single winter. But if you subtract out the trend in sea level and instead look at ranks in storm tide, the ranks only dropped to number two and number three, beat out by the blizzard of 1978. So thinking back to this cartoon of the components of water level, um, what drove having two record-breaking events in one year. Um, it was not this sea level piece. We did go back and we looked at the storm surges. It turns out that by separating out the tides from the surge, it turns out the storm surges actually were not all that big. They were sort of more on the order of the type of event you see um, one, in, one in 10 years. So sort of like, I guess, jumping ahead, giving away what the cause was, it really was this natural variation in tides. Um, and to dive into that a bit more specifically, if you look at the um, tide gauge record from this January 4th, 2018 event, um, the blue line is showing the predicted tide. And I've put these two dashed lines in that show that water level relative to mean sea level and to the average height of high tide. And um, then the green line is showing the total water level that was actually measured. And the thing to point out here is that if you look at sort of the total rise in water level above the average high tide, a decent chunk of that was just the tide being higher than average. So if this same storm had hit at a high tide that was sort of more on the order of what an average high tide is, it wouldn't have caused significant flooding. So that's all to say that tides are a primary control on flood severity in the Gulf of Maine. And the height of high tides varies naturally year to year. Um, in the Gulf of Maine, a big control on high tides is the 18.6 year lunar nodal cycle. Um, and that's the moon's elliptical orbit essentially processing 360 degrees around in space every 18.6 years. And it makes the tide range larger than average um, for about a decade and then smaller than average for about a decade. So the high gets higher and the low gets lower. So it doesn't impact mean sea level, but does impact flooding. And so, in fact, um, if you look at the 90th percentile of high tides experienced in a year over time, you can see this pretty strong decadal time scale cyclicity in it. And it's that's the 18.6 year nodal cycle. Um, in red, in this paper by Stefan Talk, um, what he did is he plotted the 10 largest water levels ever experienced in Boston on top of this time series of tides. And what stands out here is that eight of these 10 largest storm tides occurred during years when the nodal cycle was in its positive phase. So tides matter. This is a, a funny headline that came out, I think it's a couple of years back when NOAA put out their um, high tide flooding report. Oh, I'll show one thing on this last slide. So, uh, at present, we're sitting down here kind of in the negative phase of the nodal cycle. Um, and so tides over the next, starting kind of in a few years, tides, the tide range is gonna start increasing again. And we're gonna experience like a pretty, we're gonna experience kind of an acceleration in the uptick of um, high tide flooding events. 
And so this report that came out really kind of emphasized that. And the New York Times put out this headline calling the nodal cycle a moon wobble, um, how it affects the increase in flooding. And if you zoom, if you kind of zoom in on this caption under the um, under the photo, it says NASA tries to reassure the public there is nothing new or dangerous about the wobble, which I, I thought was kind of funny. Okay, so um, after going uh, sort of looking into these two 2018 flooding events, we were left wondering, um, you know, given that tides are important and predictable, how can you account for year-to-year -year changes in coastal flood hazard caused by tides? And then looking into the future, uh, can we leverage a new methodology to figure out what's the combined influence of tides and sea level rise on future flood hazard? Um, so just I'll say a tad bit more about the Gulf of Maine. Um, this is really only an important question where tides, the tide range is large. So um, we focused in on tide gauge records at Boston, Portland, and Eastport. So in the southern part of the Gulf of Maine, the tide range is about three meters. Um, and then if you go up to Portland, it's still about three meters. It goes up to six meters when you get to Eastport. And then see, they have a little box covering the top of the screen, but I think I'm showing the Bay of Fundy up there. Um, the Bay of Fundy has uh, the largest tides in the world and sort of in the northeastern most embayments, the tide range is up to 16 meters. So here's just an image from the internet showing you get these whole sort of basins that fill and drain um, between high and low tide. All right, so I've said the term flood hazard a lot of times, so I'll tell you more specifically what I'm talking about when we think about estimating flood hazard. So the information we're trying to get is a relationship between a water level, so a, a height, and the probability of seeing that height in a given year. So for, and this, this curve is showing that sort of relationship. And if you go to the NOAA Tides and Currents website, um, for anywhere they've had a, they have a tide gauge that's been measuring water levels for I think more than 40 years, they will calculate this relationship. So what this is showing, for example, is that um, the water level that we have a 10% chance of seeing in a given year, colloquially, colloquially often called the 10 year flood, is uh, about one meter above one or 1.1 meters above the average high tide. Um, and then when you move to the 1% level, that's the water level, we have a 1% chance of seeing in a given year or the 100 year flood. Um, so the way, the kind of the simplest way to get this relationship is to take all of the extreme water levels you've observed um, over the observational period and assume that's a pretty good representation of the kind of event you can get um, in an area and then fit a probability distribution to it. Um, and that's what this, this line is. And just as an example of why going, like how this sort of information actually gets applied um, for the National Flood Insurance Program, this number, the 100 year flood event or the 1% annual chance flood event, um, FEMA takes it and using all different methods, they uh, will map it onto an area. It's not always using tide gauge statistics because we don't have tide gauges everywhere. And they'll say, okay, this is the area that we think has a 1% annual chance of flooding. And if you're in that area, you're required to purchase federal flood insurance and build to flood resilient building codes. So that relationship carries a lot of weight in, in reality. So there, there are two issues with this kind of approach. One is that you can imagine that this curve, so this relationship between flood height and probability moves around over time. I mean, first over time, it's gonna creep upward as sea level rise. So the same events on top of a higher baseline sea level. Um, and the second, which I've already told you, is that if the height of high tide varies year to year and um, the height of high tide is really like the major control on how severe a flooding event is in the Gulf of Maine. This curve also jumps around year to year. The second problem, and this is a little bit more of a subtle one, is that when you fit the prop, when you fit probability distributions to high waters, if you just grab, say, like the top, um, you know, the top like 0.5 percentile of high water events, you might end up with a bunch of events where there was a pretty like average or small storm surge hitting on top of a really high tide. And so you've missed out on capturing really like the full distribution of the possible types of storms um, that can impact an area. So in Boston, for example, if you create this curve after the 2018 event, 
um, like some of the biggest events in your record are going to be small storm on top of a high tide. And it's not really accounting for the possibility of the biggest surge you may have seen on top of the highest surge you might see, on top of the highest tide you might see. Um, just as an example, sort of to put add some sort of like reality to this, the January 2018 storm tide by this methodology has about a 200 year return period or colloquially is the 200 year event. All right, so the way, um, gosh, this is like probably a year of scratching my head fit onto one slide, but the way we ended up handling that is we um, developed a statistical method where you essentially separate out storm surge from tides um, and then fit a probability distribution to um, the whole time series of skew surge, which is similar to storm surge. And then you say, okay, here are all the possibilities for storms. So we've captured sort of the like population of possible storms impacting Boston. Um, but then on top of that, every year we actually know what the high tides are going to be. So you combine that surge distribution for, with all storm possibilities for the, the discrete set of high tides that you know you're going to have in 2018, then 2019, then 2020, and into the future. Um, and that's called a convolution. So you combine those two, and then rather than just having one curve, you can have a separate curve for every year that leverages the fact that we know what tides are going to be. So again, in kind of uh, terms of reality, the, again, that sort of more traditional statistical method said that this January 2018 event was a one in 200 year event. But with this new statistical method, you can say, okay, depending on the year, actually, in reality, in the 18 tides were really big, and so it was about a 70 year event. So still a pretty, um, like a pretty severe one. So if you're interested in digging more into the details of how we did that, um, it's published in this paper in JGR. So it's a bit, it's a bit of like an esoteric exercise to apply that to events that already happened. Perhaps it's like helpful for like communication in the news. Um, but what we then wanted to do is to be able to combine that new methodology to look at how um, how tidally forced time varying flood hazard interacts with the slow and steady rise in sea level to influence future flood hazard. And again, I worked with. Um, this group of folks to develop these projections um, for the city of Boston as a part of the Greater Boston Research Advisory Group. I think actually, well, I was a NECASC fellow. Um, so as an example of the type of information we were able to produce, this is a plot showing a time series of the height of the 100-year winter flooding event. We separate winter and summer because in the winter, we're primarily in, uh, impacted by extratropical cyclones, um, like nor'easters, whereas in the summer months, it's tropical cyclones or hurricanes. So we have to have separate statistical treatment of the two types of storms. But these are the big ones that, that cause flooding um, around where we are. So the black line is showing the historical height of the 100-year flood. And then where you get transition from black to the colors, these are showing future trajectories of the 100-year flood height, um, depending on the emissions pathway, the future emissions pathway we follow. Um, and in the bottom, I've included an illustration of that 18.6 year nodal cycle. Um, and so sort of like the key take home here is that um, if you look at time periods where the nodal cycle is in a negative phase, so I've highlighted those in blue here, you have a smaller than average tide range counteracting the increase in flood hazard from sea level rise. So relative to the previous decade where maybe the nodal, where the nodal cycle was in a positive phase, like so right now we're in a negative phase time period, the increase in height of the 100 year flood event is really small. It's on the order of one to four centimeters in the intermediate um, RCP 4.5 scenario. But then when the nodal cycle switches to a positive phase and those are highlighted in red now, you get a big acceleration in the increase in flood hazard as tides start to get larger again, and then that combines with sea level rising, and you get this really accelerated flood hazard increase more on the order of 10-ish centimeters. So 
if I were to summarize all of that, um, the key take homes here are that full alignment is a major control on blood severity in the Gulf of Maine. And then sort of like absolute present day terms for what people are thinking about in the near future. Um, from 2019 to 2027, we're in this negative phase of the nodal cycle and the increase in flood hazard is being counteracted by a reduced tide range. But later towards the end of this decade, we're gonna start to see a big uptick in flood hazard as, um, as the nodal cycle enters a positive phase and tides start to get larger. Um, and so as I've come to GMRI, this is really sort of the piece um, of my previous work that I've taken with me and then started to kind of get a better sense of this side of the Venn diagram, what folks up here are interested in and kind of how I can leverage this work to um, produce flood hazard information that's actually useful to flood hazard adaptation in the Gulf of Maine. Um, so that will jump into some of the work I've been doing up in Maine. All right, so actually I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about what Gulf of Maine Research Institute does before I jump in, because we, we do a lot more than just, um, than just flood hazard science. So broadly, our mission is to develop and deliver collaborative solutions to global ocean challenges. Um, we have a sort of more traditional research department, which is um, mostly um, fisheries and ecology researchers who work on things like developing climate informed um, fishery stock assessments or looking at geographic range shifts in species driven by climate change. We have an education department that um, develops uh, like STEM materials to support science literacy in Maine youth. Um, and I think something like 70% of fifth and sixth graders in the state of Maine actually come through our building for um, a hands-on um, STEM learning experience. We have a team of people in a community department who actually um, work with people in the fishing industry, providing technical assistance or um, connecting fishermen with people who make policies in the fisheries world, um, have a business development arm. And then I sit in a new group called the Climate Center, which really sort of cuts across all of these capacities um, at GMRI. So um, GMRI, uh, the Climate Center was really dreamed up by my postdoc mentor, uh, and he actually was a former director of the Northeast and Southeast Climate Adaptation Science Center. So some of you all on the call might know him. He has a really neat background um, working in the federal government. He was a lead negotiator on the Paris Agreement um, and then eventually made his way to Maine to really focus on uh, delivering climate services at a more local scale. So the framework he's dreamed up for this climate center like brings together researchers like me. I kind of sit in this science bucket with folks focused on community and municipal engagement. And so we have um, in our climate center team, a municipal climate engagement specialist, a community engagement specialist, and a business engagement specialist, and then folks who sit in the solutions bucket. So we're, um, for example, we're going to be hiring a climate finance specialist soon who can actually help finance climate solutions. Um, and the idea is to have stakeholders sort of at the center of everything we do, um, yeah, kind of driving what we work on. All right, so the first thing I noticed when I got to Maine that I think actually I was a little bit surprised by is that a lot of Maine already floods often. Um, so this is just actually a couple wars down from my office in Portland just during a regular high tide um, this past summer. Here, and here's some more pictures sort of from the, the other side of the peninsula in Portland. So flooding's happening now and, and people care about it and are kind of urgently seeking um, adaptation solutions. So one of the closest examples of a place that already floods uh, is Union Wharf. This is um, like a hub of Portland's working waterfront that sits just a couple wharfs down from um, where the GMRI office building is. Um, it's an earth-filled wharf that's con that was constructed in 1793. So it's settling, making it particularly vulnerable to, to sea level rise and coastal flooding. Um, and it was purchased by GMRI in 2022 to preserve it as working waterfront. A lot of the wharfs in Portland are getting bought up by developers and developed into condos, for example. So one sort of long-term project GMRI is working on is figuring out how to preserve this sort of valuable 
working waterfront infrastructure for working waterfront for marine and fishing industries. Um, I had a summer intern um, for through the NSF REU program this past summer who worked with me. Uh, you know, perhaps I should jump ahead to this first. Um, then I'll, I'll go back and talk about Connor. But importantly, Union Wharf also floods now. So this is these are some photos from the storm that hit on December 23rd of this past year, so just before the holidays. Um, so if you actually, it sort of almost looks like you're looking at the ocean towards the wharf, but ocean is kind of in the far view of this picture on the left. Um, one thing that is really kind of interesting about um, flooding along working waterfronts is if you go visit these buildings, when it's not flooding, they're corroding from the inside um, because the first floors of these buildings are used for things like lobster processing. And so they're designed to take salt water. So they're, it's almost like a, oh, and these buildings are, um, it's construction that's built to last for decades rather than a century, so 30 to 40 years. So working waterfronts are sort of like uniquely uniquely resilient um, to coastal flooding and there's an open door for creative adaptation solutions. So over the summer, I had an intern through the REU program who um, whose goal was to develop flood thresholds for Union Wharf, so to figure out like what are the you know, given that the first floors of these buildings can take in salt water, like what are the key things on the wharf that we actually care about? Um, and then what's the what's the actual flood risk to those places? So what he was able to do is um, he worked with uh, the facilities director at GMRI to kind of like talk about different vulnerabilities of the wharf and found that it really is the utilities on the wharf that are vulnerable. It's like in the winter, for example, if uh, a furnace floods and the flame goes out, you freeze pipes and you have to shut down operations for weeks while it gets repaired. So what he was able to do is sort of take the statistics for flooding in Portland that I developed. Um, again, during my PhD through the stuff I showed you earlier, map them on top of elevation data, and then um, go out and measure the heights of all of the sort of key utilities on the wharf and get a really detailed view. Like for example, saying that in 20, around 2030, the event that we have a 10% chance of seeing will put 20 centimeters of water um, in, the boil, in the boiler room and damage the pump encasing. Um, so, our hope here is to further develop this project this summer to do a cost benefit analysis that'll really be able to inform a detailed utility replacement strategy over the just like coming 10 to 15 years. Um, because if this, these are the vulnerabilities you're talking about, it's like relatively straightforward if you know what to do to put these heat pumps up on top of welded frames or to replace, figure out what the lifetime is of this, the remaining lifetime is of this furnace and decide when you're gonna replace it for example, with heat pumps on top of welded frames. Um, and then in the future, the idea is to try to have the process we follow be transferable and replicable to other working waterfronts um, throughout the region. So part of GMRI purchasing this wharf, knowing that it floods, was really seeing an opportunity um, to create a playbook for, for future flooding events. All right, so second project that I had mentioned before was um, developing this coastal flood risk model for the state of Maine. So the types of flood hazard information that I showed you before, those are all based on calculating statistics from tide gauge records or measured water levels. Those are great in that they're based on observations. Um, and so they're, you know, they're based on observation and reality, but the issue is that we don't have that, we don't have a lot of coverage of um, tide gauges with 40 plus year records in Maine or in the Gulf of Maine at all. So for example, in Maine, I think we have five tide gauges with 40 plus year records. And so there's a lot of space in between those tide gauges. And for example, in Maine, in a single town, you might have a peninsula where the coastline faces three different directions and one side might be river influenced and sheltered from waves and the other side might be wave exposed. So getting really great statistics at the Portland tide gauge might not apply to somewhere that's just like 20 miles up the coastline. Um, so the way that we handle getting, the, the way that more kind of 
geographically granular and continuous flood information is produced um, is by dynamic modeling. And that can actually get you information like I'm showing in the upper right from the model that exists from Massachusetts that was developed by Woods Hole Group, where you have sort of like a map and a spatially continuous view of um, what various probabilities are of flooding are or what inundation paths of water might look like during a flooding event. So in practice, the way those work is you build a like model representation of the area you're interested in. So you um, build a model of the offshore bathymetry, the onshore topography. Um, you define the surface roughness of every node in your model. And then you fill it up with water. So, and how much you fill it up depends on what sea level scenarios you're interested in. And then you actually drive the model with, um, with wind. Um, from a statistically representative set of tropical cyclones and extratropical cyclones under present and future climatology. What becomes really important in Maine is that you choose to phase it with enough different tides that you actually sort of capture all possibilities of flooding. And I'll, I'll dive into that a little bit more specifically in a sec. So then you have a coupled um, storm surge wave and river model, then you so you, you run all your scenarios, you do some statistics on the model output, and then you end up getting that type of curve I showed you that has the relationship between extreme water level and probability at all model nodes, rather than just at the locations of tide gauges. So Woods Hole Group is, um, I'm collaborating with them along with some folks at UMaine and UNH to develop this, um, this sort of model for Maine that already exists for Massachusetts and that they're developing for New Hampshire. And the piece that is really important in Maine is how you phase with tides. And, and that's the piece that I'm working on. So um, I'm gonna pick on an existing model for a sec, just to kind of illustrate the importance of that tidal phasing piece and how I'm thinking about it. So here is a model developed by the US Army Corps of Engineers um, called NAX. That, is, that stands for the North Atlantic Coast Comprehensive Study. They have this huge model domain um, and running these things is really computationally intensive. And so um, it's sort of a balancing act between how many sea level scenarios you wanna simulate, how many storm scenarios you wanna simulate, and then how many tidal phasings for each storm you wanna run. So like phasing the same storm for a whole bunch of different um, heights of high tides. And so what they decided to do, because they have this huge model domain where it's important to run a lot of different storm scenarios, both tropical and extra tropical cyclones, they said, okay, let's take um, the month in the historical record that had high variance and high tides. And it was September, 2010. And this red is showing you a histogram. Oh, um, this is for Eastport, Maine. So um, this is the northeasternmost tide gauge I showed you that's sort of right at the main Canada border Canada border where the tide range is six meters. Um, so those September 2010 tides, the heights of those are shown in this histogram in red. I overlaid it with um, a full nodal cycles worth of tides, so 19 years worth of tides, and that's this, this blue histogram here. And it's showing that those September 2010 tides are missing out on the, the really like the biggest, there's actually another bar here. So the top um, like 60 centimeters of possible high tides. And those are really the events that drive extreme flooding in this area. So another way to think about it, high tide in Eastport has two meters of variability. Whereas like the max storm surge in that area is a little bit over one meter. So it's a like it's a trade off between in the trade off between how many storms you simulate and how many tides you simulate. It's really more important to capture the tides up in Eastport, Maine. And so if you like put it, putting it in concrete terms, if you look at their results, this is similar to the curve I showed you before from NOAA that has the relationship between water level and probability, but I've rotated it 90 degrees. So here's water level on the x-axis, probability on the y-axis, this um, 0.01, this is the 1% um, annual chance event or 100 year event. So this blue curve is showing results from this NAX model at the Eastport tide gauge saying that the 100 year flood is about 3.8 meters or so. But then if you compare it to just like doing statistics on the tide gauge record at Eastport, um, the actual, the 100 year flood height is 
gosh, the half meter axes are um, are a little difficult to think about on the fly, but they're underestimating the 100 year flood height by essentially like half a meter. Um, so what I did is I, in the model results, they published um, model runs just from storm surge separate from the combined tide and storm surge results. And just by essentially taking their storm surge model runs and combining it with um, like a set of tide predictions that are based on the tide gauge, I was able to shift the tide statistics over to this red curve, which matches observations and the tide gauge record a whole lot better. And so what this means in terms of trying to develop a new model for Maine um, is that like if we had infinite uh, computational researchers, let's say that we wanted to use like simulate 500 storms to capture like a good set of possibilities for Maine for sea level rise scenarios. Over 18.6 years, there's 13,000 tides, um, 13,000 high tides. That would be 26 million model runs, which is, is not computationally feasible. So the task I have now is essentially figuring out how can I select, given a certain sort of number of model runs that we want, to, we can accomplish, how can I select a subset of these 13,000 tides that will lead to statistics that, um, that are reliable? Um, and so I anticipate that we're probably going to be done with that work in about 2025. All right. Last project I'll touch on is the, um, actually, hold on, I see I have a question bubble popping up. Okay, I'm going to come back to um, that question at the end. Okay, so Last project is um, installing tide gauges and developing flood thresholds uh, for Maine. So one um, one challenge in Maine, like I mentioned, is that we have sort of sparse coverages, sparse coverage of tide gauges that provide real time water level measurements. Um, and so real time water level measurements have all sorts of applications for um, navigation, for waterfront operations. But um, when it comes to flooding, one sort of key um, sort of key purpose they serve is supporting the National Weather Service and putting out flood forecasts. So here's an example. If you go to the National Weather Service, um, the coastal hazards page for the, the gray office, um, you can click on Portland and it's going to show you the observed water level in blue. And then it says for the next three days, here's the water level. Um, here are the water levels that we're forecasting. They develop those water level forecasts both like by running the types of numerical mo both by running numerical models um, that can forecast water level, but they don't publish results at places where they don't have real time water level measurements to validate the model against. So essentially to make sure they're not like under or over predicting by by half a meter, like a NAX model in Eastport might do. Um, so forecasters are looking at the model generated forecast and looking at tide gauge data and then actually performing um, manual bias corrections to the forecast. So there are only sort of a handful of discrete places where National Weather Service will put out forecasts. So one of the reasons that there's so few tide gauges in Maine is that these things are really expensive to install and maintain. The NOAA tide gauges are measuring water level um, or they're, they're surveyed in to um, give water levels at millimeter scale accuracy so that they can uh, track long-term changes in water level. But for the purposes of coastal flooding, we really don't need to be measuring water level with millimeter accuracy. Centimeter accuracy is just fine. And there is a whole sort of host of new tide gauge technologies that are coming from everyone from university groups to startups to um, sort of like enthusiastic home tinkerers in Maine that I've met. And so we've been working with some of these groups to, let's see, I kind of lost my ability to advance slides. Huh. There we go. Um, to install these, some of these emerging low cost tide gauge technologies uh, in coastal communities in Maine that exist in these like, forecast gaps from the National Weather Service. So for example, here's, um, here's an image of me installing one in St. George in the mid coast Maine region. It's just these really simple devices that have, um, this is one that is built by Hohonu, which is a startup based out of Hawaii. 
it just um, it shoots an ultrasonic signal down to the water and then has a sensor in it to calculate the time it takes to come back. It's solar powered and it has a cell chip in it to, um, to transmit data in real time. So I was talking to a group of kids in St. George about this project recently and here's a, this is the slide I showed them. So um, you said there are flood forecasters, like there are weather service, like there are weather forecasters. And if they say to um, the emergency management agency or municipal officials in your town, that water levels are gonna reach 13 and a half feet on Tuesday. Um, that's not particularly meaningful if you don't know um, what the, if that 13 and a half feet um, of water means that there's gonna be a foot of water on Route 131 or like the wastewater treatment plant is gonna have water coming up towards its pumps. So getting that kind of really localized flood hazard information requires having both um, in the same place, knowing how high water level is and having people who have observed what the impacts of those water levels are. And that's something that's been done in places where there are um, motivated National Weather Service forecasters to go out and look at flood impacts and there are tide gauges. So for example, in Portland, Maine, we have pretty good flood thresholds where you can get information. These are all in um, water heights and feet relative to mean lower low water. And it'll tell you things that when, like when water level reaches 13.8 feet above mean lower low water, you have water entering and flooding businesses near Portland Pier. So getting this kind of really localized information requires a lot of boots on the ground making observations, which again is challenging um, when you have a lot of coastline. So in addition to installing these tide gauges in communities, um, we're co-locating the tide gauges with community science programs where um, we worked with the National Weather Service main community call where people can go out and um, take pictures and make observations and that will actually support the National Weather Service in putting out flood uh, watches and advisories and warnings um, based on sort of the um, based on paired water level and um, flood up and flood impact observations. So this is, we're also working on kind of developing an online platform for it. But for example, if you're someone who lives around Portland, this, this is a map of Portland, you can log on and see, okay, these are locations that, um, that the city or local emergency management has decided that are like we're worried about in terms of flooding. You can go to these predetermined locations when flooding is forecasted and go out and submit observations. And sort of to just to revisit the community collaborative research piece, I think one thing, um, this project was, um, I was funded for a, to conduct a six month pilot and then was able to develop a proposal to expand the project. And I think perhaps the biggest, um, sort of like the biggest learning from me was that kind of the most important part of that six month pilot period was not installing the tide gauge. It wasn't developing the community science program. It was really going through the process of, um, going through the process of figuring out what people needed in terms of flood hazard research enabled us to start building this cross-sector network in Maine that would actually be prepared to leverage the new water level and flood impact data we were collecting um, to build resilience and sustain data collection. Otherwise, we're just sort of feeding data into the ether and it's not supporting much. And so, um, you really learned a lot over the last six months, bringing together groups of researchers, forecasters, emergency managers, um, local decision makers, resilience practitioners, community organizations, engaged community members who are participating in the community science programs, youth who are participating, and their teachers. So I think just being able to make this list and bring this list of people together was perhaps the most impactful outcome of the first six months of this project, which I think is a reality of a lot of community-driven research. All right, um, that is all I have, and I will stop sharing my screen and I'm happy to take some questions.